like new to the to to the trim and to to the meta practice but i have like um a really strong background in bhakti uh -huh. and um i really like like the approach of the six r's and uh, that you focus on the meta and, and make it grow but what my current situation is is that when i do the um the meta practice that i get so intoxicated i get like so immersed in completely immersed in, into, into like total ecstasy that i can't do anything like and you're doing and, it the wrong way i understand i understand exactly what it is okay um first of all metta is not for bliss not for the purpose of bliss metta is a dana practice the brahma viharas is a dana practice when the part i when you were doing bhakti when you were saying you were studying bhakti before is it a concentration meditation no it is definitely not actually the thing was um like i was able to um to go into these uh, spontaneous uh, you know states of like a, a total total love and that have the byproduct which is like bliss but i had like really bad concentration skills and i was like um yeah the, the main reason why i wanted to train my concentration I developed this because I had like difficulties at university to concentrate and I was also wondering why I get into all these um, uh, blissful states without having really good concentration skills and well they can't get into the blissful states uh, with concentration most of the time and they'll tell you that in order to get into concentration it could take you up to five or ten years yeah but that, and, and in my opinion i've been doing this for 21 years in my opinion when somebody has been practicing that way um the fact is this is a hunch i have it's an idea i have from what from talking to many many people that if a person is is practicing a concentration with a very focused concentration type of practice the only way bliss ever happens is when the conditions become right and we know now that the conditions are to lighten up the concentration and so if by sort of accidentally one time it gets less concentrated that's how they experience this but when you listen to them talk to you they'll say i've been working five six years i've never even made it to first jhana but let's look at a couple things this is all when we're seeking bliss bliss is not the cure you're looking for it doesn't sound like it to me okay yeah, like, it sounds like, for, to me like what you want to understand is you want you, right now you don't seem to understand what bliss is and what the practice was actually for what was the buddha doing how did he do it? Why did he do it? Did he find something? And can I do that too? If he found relief, can I do that too? And in the benefit of looking at to this this way is you go into it as a non-religious, uh, you know, way of looking at how mind operates in the human being. And you're going to discover um, how actually feeling is not emotion. Emotion is not feeling. You're going to learn how that works. You're going to learn exactly what suffering actually is, how it occurs. And the big one is when you under learn what the cause of it is, the Buddha even found the symptoms of it as it's arising. So then you're learning to watch uh, the body, but you're also, I was just talking this morning to two of the people that are here and trying to explain the Buddha turned everything sort of upside down when he showed up. Everybody in India at the time, they were practicing uh, subject to object. So you're the subject and you have an objective and that's what you're concentrating on. Okay. And the Buddha shows up and he says, oh, look at this. The way to do it was actually to turn the subject into the object and to go to the source right here of the mind, which is the forerunner of everything, of every thought which precedes an intention, which turns into an action, which causes things to happen. Okay? And so he actually goes to the source of the whole thing, where when you look what's happened today, we hear about Vipassana, we hear about jhana, okay? But now we know that jhana and, and Vipassana, the two 
were actually the Samatha and the Vipassana were actually two components of one practice. We also know that all the practices that have ever come into it concerning Buddhism were trying to get to the same objective, which they called Nibbana. And Nibbana is not a place. Nibbana is not like something we control. Nibbana is the absence of a lot, the abandonment of everything, trying. We weren't supposed to be trying to do anything. We were supposed to have been watching. So it's an interesting evolution about how this all came about since they were trying so hard with these other projects with using an object and trying very hard to concentrate on it. So when we look at mind uh, the meditation as a definition here, first we say it is observing the movement of mind's attention in order to see clearly how everything works. Then if we want to refine it a little more with a few more words, we'll say, in order to see clearly the Four Noble Truths and the dependent origination and the three characteristics very, very clearly, which will show us how everything actually works. Now, in some suttas, it'll tell us in order for you to get to the total opening of your mind, which means that you are opening up to the potential of your mind completely within the present time when you're practicing anything. This means when you're working on a subject at school, preparing for an exam, sorting out a dozen things you have to do in the office, or working on the line to oversee a whole bunch of workers in, say, the material handling department of a big corporation, and you have to figure out what everybody's going to do for scheduling. This can get really complicated. But if you learn how to do one thing at a time and your attention is only here and you follow his instructions, you learn what to do with something that comes up on the side or hits you from over here from the future or the past. So the second part, let, before I explain that part, the present, the past and the future, let me give you the second definition. So the first one was the meditation itself is how you are going to observe your mind in order to see how everything works by watching in every event that happens, every time something arises, how the Four Noble Truths operate and how that 12 links, uh, the actually show you seven links of the dependent origination are operating and how the three characteristics come into play. Characteristics are anicca, dukkha, anatta, okay? Anicca means impermanence of everything. So there's no reason to get uptight about anything in the world because the fact is nobody is stuck. <laughs> nobody is stuck because everything's going to change and it keeps changing all the time. And even the universe is in a state of flux. You watch our governments right now, you watch everything that's going on in the world. Everything is in flux, which means it's not still, it's moving like that all the time. And then anatta is the impersonal nature of everything, okay? The suffering is the dukkha. So anicca, dukkha, anatta, you hear this in all the different Buddhist traditions, okay? Second, the second definition, Ben, is medi the, uh, that's the mind, the meditation. Now we're gonna talk about the mindfulness itself. The meditation became the Buddha's instrument to operate, to see how everything works. Now, the mindfulness is actually a type of observation, a skilled form of observation, okay? And it's a skilled form of observation that you learn how to apply it, okay? And the, the nice part about the nice part about the, the, um, the mindfulness is that this mindfulness has a kind of memory thing inside of it, okay? So it has, it reminds you, it recalls, um, and it tries to help you to remember something. So what is it doing? It's helping you to remember that when something comes up in your mind, any form of distraction, 
Okay, any type of uh, distraction that happens or disturbance in your meditation, anything you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, or it comes up in your mind, anything, okay? When that happens, that's where TWIM comes in. And you remember, I have to apply the steps of the TWIM at this point. Now, one thing I do with a lot of young people is I say, it might be easier for you to think about this when and that something comes up, you're going to train your mind to never mind. You're going to train it to never mind this. So you recognize that something came up, okay? And then you, when you're recognizing, you're saying to yourself, never mind this. I'm just going to do what I'm doing. Just going to be here focusing only on the present time activity that I'm doing, okay? So when you recognize it, you're going to be letting it go. You're saying, never mind, let it go, relax, smile, come back very quickly. This is like two or three seconds. Don't ever get mixed up about these instructions. Don't think that when I say let go, relax, it's, oh, let relax. Well, it took me some time. You tell me it took some time to do that. So then I came back and I started meditating again. Don't do that. These are steps that you're teaching your brain this is what I want you to do. Whenever this feeling comes up of tension and tightness, where I feel like I'm being pulled away from what I'm doing on my desk in the present time, I need to, whoops, just never mind that. Let it go, relax, smile, come back. That's that quick. That's what we need to remember about TWIM. So the recognize, release, relax, re smile, return, repeat thing is English, isn't it? <laughs> It doesn't work in German either. It doesn't work in French or in Spanish or Yugoslavian or anything else, it, or Russian either. It doesn't work, you know, and over here in Asia, it's a very funny thing. We're saying these R's, six R's, but we know we need to call it TWIM. Why do we call it TWIM? Because we are tranquil, wisdom, insight, meditation. So why did we do that? Tranquil is samatha, wisdom is seeing and understanding by seeing, knowing something by seeing it, knowledge and vision. We're going back to the way the Buddha taught. He taught you, you cannot learn to practice, learn and practice what he was teaching unless you learn it through knowledge and vision first, and then it turns into knowledge and wisdom. So you have meditation now, right? And now mindfulness is to remember to always handle anything that arises in the same way. And the key thing that you learn from TWIM is to let it go. And the moment you let it go, you're not thinking about it, then you need to replace it. TWIM also is a trap. Okay, how is it a trap? <laughs> okay. Um, it's a trap because it's actually called right effort. And this is in the Eightfold Path. It's number six, Sama Wayama. And the thing about the, the four steps of right effort used to be called the four steps of right effort, but now it's been switched across time. And I call this one of the slippages that happen. And you're going to find people saying one of the right efforts. But that's not right, because this was a practice, this right effort, and it had four steps. So let's look at the steps. If we split it like this, and we have now two on the top and two on the bottom, this one was to recognize it, okay? And I recognize something is there, but just note that it's there. Don't no go beyond noticing it's beginning to happen, okay? And then you release. The un, these are both the, the unwholesome, release, see the unwholesome state and release it there. Now you have purified the mind. But then we have to do the other two if we expect any change to happen for us. We have to then bring up, re relax and give a, a smile. And both of those are, those are um, you know, those are replacing the unwholesome. Recognize, release, and relax. That's the purification. Resmile, okay? 
and you return. And when you return, your re-smile is bringing up a wholesome and then keep that going and keep producing other things that feel the same vibration, the same frequency as that wholesome. So you're always working in the wholesome mind states as much as possible. So now we're showing you what is actually happening. Craving is usually what they'll say to you is desire. It's desire. But if I do not elaborate on explaining what I mean, you might think it just means I should desire nothing. And that's a mistake. Because when you're living your life, do you desire to do well at school? Do you desire to have a good relationship? Do you desire to make things work in your life? These are desires too. So desire turns out this word chanda is the Pali word. It's a neutral word. It's, uh, it is uh, not this way or that way. It can be either side, depending on the paragraph where the word comes in a sutta tells you what they're talking about using that word, okay? But you're wanting to develop wholesome desire. Wholesome desire is to a good thing, to succeed in whatever you are doing in life, to be of service to people well in your life with a balanced way for yourself. Almost all of the teaching, well, actually, I would say all of the teaching in the Buddha has to do with a dana structure. Dana sila bhavana is the first part of your training before you can succeed at the meditation. Okay? So the dana means generosity. Why is he put that in the very beginning of your training? Like you show up in the woods to be a monk or a forest monk, but he says, okay, now you have to learn to live with people and you have to be giving and supporting and step back and help with everything working, not demand that it be the way that you want it to be, but work together. There's a there is a good uh, description in uh, Majima Nikai number 128 from section 11 through 15 is describing how these monks were living together so balanced. So all of what the Buddha was teaching was to learn how the suffering actually works. And when he said that the craving, he, he tells you what the craving is, it is the I like it or the I don't like it mind. That is what the craving is. And the craving always manifests. It always comes up first in your mind with a change in the tension in your body. And you're describing that, Ben. When you talk about, I have this good feeling with me most of the time. The question is, do you have this good feeling only towards yourself and what you're doing? Or are you carrying this good feeling towards other people as well, okay? Because when we look at the, um, the structure of metta, metta is only the first um, part of the Brahma Vihara practice. And the Brahma Vihara has four, four pieces. And that's a good thing to look at, these four pieces in the Brahma Vihara practice that we use for your object of meditation to train with. They are causally related. These four are causally related. So the first one, that one is metta. And when you're practicing the metta, you don't just take it for yourself. If you take it for yourself, you'll burn out. It wasn't meant to be taken for yourself. That's like narcissism. All mine, nobody else's, just me. I got to survive and just me. But the trick, trick to a really nice, calm, progressive, full life is to learn that giving this metta to other people, even if you're giving your smile away as you're practicing it and living your life, you're going to get a lot back, a whole lot back from that. Some people could say that was selfish, but I, it gets mixed up, doesn't it? Because if I give, the more I give, the more I get back. And getting it back is to feel good to be able to give more. This is a feeding um, system. Yeah? Okay. Can, I, can I make a comment here? 
Sure. Uh, I think that uh, whether that is selfish or not really depends on the intention. Uh, like, do I do something in order to have like a gain that comes back, or am I only interested in the the, the, better, the betterment of, of of the other of the other person? The solution to this is that the way that you were doing it was as if the meta alone should exist and be worked with that way. But what I can show you is you need to learn to be working with the meta, training with it a bit of a different way. The meta, um, the meta comes from your heart and when you, but the purpose of your heart is to be supporting each other in existence in this world. We say, well, why are we here? We're here to help each other. Believe it or not, all of us on this earth, on this planet, are here to be helping each other. That's what we forget. We, we really do. We forget that. And we end up working for ourselves instead of for each other. By working with a spiritual friend, and it cannot, you know, you can start, you should go over to, you can go over to Damasuka dot org and go into the basic meta instructions but please listen to the whole set of instructions do not listen to just a 10 minute version at least the first time you listen listen to a 30 minute version of the meta instructions with me giving them or with bonte giving them when you are working with your practice you should always be starting with the you're right everything you're you're saying is correct you don't try to concentrate too hard. Your, our concentration is supposed to be open like this, not pointed on anything, not pointing to the meta. You, we teach you how to take one person and, uh, and basically start using them as your first object of meditation. And it's just your first object of meditation. And you take a person of the same sex, so there's no lust that can arise, okay? You take a person of the same sex and you start sending, may you be happy. May I be happy for yourself. Fill it up with some, you can get to chaos. If you angry at yourself or something, this isn't gonna work, but it works very well if you start to send it to yourself for 10 minutes and then after that you start sending it to another person and you don't move at all and you remember that if you don't like something that comes up you don't do anything with it other than witnessing it came up and remembering it didn't come up because you stopped sending it to your friend it just came up impersonally arose when it impersonally arises you simply never mind it and you let go, relax, smile and come back. It's that quick. And you have completed recognizing it, releasing it, relaxing your, your mind of anything that's left over. But don't examine that. Just do this very quick. You're, you're sending messages to your brain and you're saying from now on, I want you to just let go of anything. And what actually what you described to me, your meta is turning into a hindrance for you. So we know that you're doing it wrong. Um, like um, it, it's not necessarily um, the, the meta itself, but the, the bliss and the ecstasy that is the, uh, a byproduct. And, and but, the, the, but meta doesn't, but if you're giving this away, you simply give it away and keep smiling and just simply let it go out from you. The, the problem is that you don't know how to shine. Right now, you're a candle that's trying to stay lit inside a bottle, and it's suffocating. Yeah, if you light a big candle and put a big globe over it without any ventilation, pretty soon it will go out. Do you get a headache or you feel exhausted after you're practicing it all? Um, no, it's, um, I just feel, um, I feel so, I feel so good that I don't have motivation to do anything. It's like that's, see, that's wrong kind of bliss. That's a um, destructive bliss that turns out to be a destructive thing instead of a helpful thing. And wh when you're doing your meta, you're you're taking it and it's like this. I have a pool. It's 120 degrees. I have a swimming pool with a fence around it. I'm going to swim in it, and nobody else can have it. 
and I get such bliss and relaxation and all my exhaustion is gone. I'm not going to let anybody in this pool. I'm just going to get out, lay on the chaise and just, wow, trip with Meta. I don't have any motivation to do anything. That's because you kept it all. That's because you kept it all. That's what this is. And it's actually pulling you down as a hindrance for your life, isn't it? It's become a destructive force instead of what it should become. You're, you should be, as you're giving it to the other person and you're seeing them smile, then when they smile, it moves on to working with some other kinds of people. By, we can guide you to work with some other kinds of people, like 11 other people. Then when you get to that level and you get through that level of working, then we show you how to work with the directions. And then you're basically a very powerful meta uh, practitioner, but it's not going to wear you out. You know, this, you're giving it to all beings, all living beings in the world, but not through one sitting, just saying, I'm going to do that. It's not like that at all. You're actually building the power in the proper way so that when you sit with metta, then it shines out of you. And this goes out and touches the people around you. And it lifts them up and they want to know how to do it. And they learn to do it, to lift up, you see? By doing it that way, you don't ever, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't interrupt your life. It feeds you because this will turn into when you move, it moves uh, first, it will shift and it will move up into your head and it won't be coming from your heart. It will be coming from your head. Now, if you were to move this, allow to move this up in the head at this point, it could burn your head up because you don't know how to shine. So that would be like, well, um, lighting the candle and then putting your hand over it and trying to hold it and keep it lit at the same time. Can't do it. You burn your hand and you can burn your brain doing that way. But if you are actually um, learning how to shine it out, just by allowing it. And it isn't learning how to do anything. It's tricky with language. We're learning to shine, allowing ourselves to shine. I don't know if you remember, I don't know in Germany if they had this little song, but in America, they had this little Christian song. It was all, I'm going to shine for God tonight. I'm going to shine for God. I'm going to shine for God tonight. Oh, right down the line. I'm going to shine for God. I'm going to shine, going to shine, going to shine. That's what I'm telling you. You shine. Then when you've given it to one person, you start to give it to different types of people, even the enemies or anyone that's troubling for you, you learn how to do that. And then after that, you go, and this training happens very quickly in like two, three days, four days, maybe to learn to do that. When you get to the directions, then when you sit down, you start working with the directions. And while this is moving through the other people and moving through sending it to all beings, what you're doing with it is evolving the it's actually developing in a particular way so the loving kindness is coming from your heart first tell me if it's coming from your heart is it coming from your heart when you do this do you feel it in your chest yeah it's it's very passive it's like not i am doing anything or like trying to um... i know i'm not talking about doing anything if it's in your heart and it's getting really powerful did it try to move up and you tried to keep it in your heart did you do that no but one thing, one thing, what, what happens is that um, it, um, yeah, kind of like, um, also like expands. Um. Okay, what's happening is you're you are controlling it, but it's it's subconscious types of controlling. It's subconsciously you're controlling it. You don't realize it because you have to back up. See, it's an unconscious form of of concentration that's being used here. Because you you like this bliss, see? And when it comes, you, wow, this is nice. Okay, pour it on me again. <laughs> I, I, I get um I, I, I get what, what you're saying. And like um when I was looking at it like really with when I was examining my myself with, with self-honesty, I also like recognized that that there's like you know a liking and 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 um, a, a clinging to that bliss, and I recognized that like this is not this is not good. So I started to detach from the bliss and to 
just like don't um yeah don't cling to it um but yeah like okay now stop stop right there just what you said i try say it again i try to just let it go detach myself from it did you hear yourself say that see yeah. now i want you i want you to listen to something very carefully Majima Nikai number 22 in section 10, probably 10 or it's a statement that exists between the Buddha and um, I, it's not 10, I think it's like six or eight. I think it is. I never can keep this straight. <laughs> Maybe may I'll check in the book. It's it's Sutta, the Alagadupama Sutta. It's number 22, and it's I think it's section six. I think it is. And here is this statement, this monk, Arata, the monk Arata had a problem. He's a young monk. He's like a one-year monk. Their new monks are coming in and he's telling them, it's okay for you to engage a, uh, an obstacle if it comes up when you're meditating. It's okay. That's what he's saying. He's saying it's okay. And the monks, the other monks know this is wrong. And they say, we have to go get the Buddha. We have to have him come and explain this to him. He cannot keep telling these young, these other monks who are coming in are hearing this the wrong way. They were upset. So they call the Buddha and the Buddha comes. And the Buddha basically has a statement that he says to him, go ahead. Do you, can you read it to him? Read it to him, May. It's section six. And the Buddha... Yeah. The, Okay, the Buddha says that. Okay, you got it? So read it to him. What does he say to him? He first, he says, misguided man. And he's saying, you crazy guy, why weren't you listening to my talks? <laughs> he's basically saying that. Okay, and then he says, what? Misguided man, to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in that way? Misguided man, have I not stated in many ways how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. That's all we need. It's all we need right there. So this is the lesson, an obstacle which comes up. And in this case, the obstacle is the bliss, heavy, heavy, dripping wet bliss. When the obstacle comes up, okay, We do not feed it. An obstacle can only become an obstruction in our meditation or in our life if we feed it. You see? If you, if you engage it. And engaging means what? Personally embracing it. Embracing it. And what are you embracing it? You're saying, well, I, I don't mean to embrace it. No, but it's decking you. Basically, you soaked in the pool, you dove in the bliss, <laughs> you just sat, you're like there, I'm innocent, I just sat down and it happened. That's only because you've been letting this happen for a while, and it's going to take a little bit of work to straighten this out. Remember that you can simply use the six R's on them, and that simply is releasing them, relaxing any tension they caused by disturbing you bringing up a smile and saying, okay, so you came up, you'll be there, you'll exist, and then you'll go away. This is the way you need to start. You, you can look at this bliss. It came up, it's there, it'll go away. Yeah. But if the bliss is decking you, and basically this deck, this is like a heavy duty disturbance that comes in your life and just decks you so that you can't do anything else. You can't say that's the result of what the Buddha was teaching. It's not at all correct because he was teaching something that made you very stable, clear in your mind, able to understand. Here's what he said, in order for you to experience the complete opening of the mind, he wanted you to fully understand, see and understand the origination, the disappearance, how it arises and how it passes away, the gratification, how you personally get involved with it, and the danger of that, which is to take you out of the present time and pull you in the direction of something that happened in the past or some worry in the future. See? Ape from anything disturbing you during your daily life, 
so that you can continue working in the present time.